Hello everyone, this is the Adafruit CircuitPython, or the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for April 8th, 2024. Uh, this is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Python. I'm Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. Uh, first I'll apologize for the frog in my throat, um, but I have a daycare cold courtesy of my two-year-old. Um, CircuitPython is a version of Python designed for on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. Um, we hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes talk, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPython Nisa's Discord role. There's a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the meeting that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, after each meeting, we post the link to the next meeting's Discord or notes document to the circuit to the Circuit Python Dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc, so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, uh, the notes doc is the place to leave hug reports and status updates for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. This is a brief look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware uh, in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project as a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Uh, it's done as a round robin. Um, status updates is also done as a round robin. Excuse me. Uh, status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. The fifth part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. That covers how the meeting will go and I'll get started, uh, take a time code and do community news. And if you do hear pauses, I'm trying to, I, I do have some coughs and I'm trying to pause or mute my mic, not for the live folks, but for the recording folks. All right, so community news, uh, is a preview of the newsletter. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the headline here is CircuitPython 9.0.3 was released. It's the latest bug fix release of CircuitPython and is a new stable release. The only changes from 9.03 to 9.02 are fixed for analog in on Nordic NRF uh, boards and the addition of a WaveShare RP2040 Geek board. Um, and there's links to the release notes there. Next up. Expressive chip news. Back in our January 10th, 2023 issue, uh, we discussed the new ESP32C6 and ESP32P4. Uh, the C6 is on the market and Espressive has more P4 news. Adafruit has announced that the Adafruit ESP32C6 Feather, a C6 development board in the ubiquitous Feather form factor, it integrates 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi 6, BLE 5, and the 802.15.4 protocol. Brings the goodness you know for the low cost C3 series and improves it with Zigbee, also known as 802.15.4 at 2.4 gigahertz. It can make for great matter development hardware. There's also a BME 280 temperature and humidity sensor to make an integrated sensor node. Regarding the P4, there's a new video just released by Espressive saying unveiling the ESP32 P4. A uh, high performing SOC with extensive IO connectivity, HMI, and security features. 
There's a YouTube video and a product page link there as well. And DJ Devin3 notes in the chat that uh, the P4 does not have Wi-Fi. So just heads up, that's the one of the first chips from Espresso that doesn't have Wi-Fi, or a radio at all, actually. It's the first one I know of that without a radio completely. Um, I'm sure that'll change. Okay, um, last up in our community news, the Python Software Foundation has a news and brief. Uh, first, the PSF has uh, joined the Open Initiative for Cybersecurity cyber Standards. Um, there's an April 2024 newsletter, including PyCon 2024 information and more, and then also a blog post about reporting malware on PyPI. So take a look at those things. Newsletter details. Um, these stories come from the Python and Microcontrollers weekly newsletter, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. The complete archives are available at the URL adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub. Uh, submit a pull request uh, with the changes. You may also email uh, cpnews at adafruit.com or tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or X. All right, that's, up for, that's it for community news. Next, we have the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Uh, this is a uh, kind of objective uh, view on how, how CircuitPython and its core components are doing. Uh, meant to balance the later parts where we'll talk about more subject subjectively about how things are going. So first, the numbers overall. Um, 20, over our, all of the CircuitPython related repos, we had 28 pull requests merged from 15 different authors. Some new folks to me are Brushmate, Sean the IT guy, um, and Fabien Chateau. Uh, those are all new-ish names to me, so thanks to the new folks. Um, we had seven reviewers. Uh, thank you again to all of our reviewers who support our authors. Um, overall, we had 18 closed issues by seven people and 19 open by nine, 19 people. So lots of engagement in terms of different uh, folks filing issues. And we're only net, net up one, which is great. So now for the core. So this is the uh, C, C core of CircuitPython. Um, we had 16 pull requests merged from 10 different authors. Uh, those new names are listed here as well. And uh, two reviewers, myself and Dan. Uh, we have 21 open pull requests. So I think we're comfortably under that 25 limit uh, where we have to have more than one page. <clears throat> we had 12 closed issues by four people and nine open by 19 people by nine people so we're net down three which is awesome and uh, getting close to double digits in terms of folks involved uh, we have a total of 673 open issues we have nine active milestones um, the core ones are 910 which is going to be the next kind of feature release which is has uh, no open issues actually uh, 9xx is like work we want to do kind of soonish is has 25 open issues there is one open issue for 82x which I will talk about later if I don't forget um, it's not necessarily an a2 issue but it's an interaction between some of the NRF bootloaders and circuit Python um, and we have three issues not assigned a milestone when these stats were taken so we're just gonna have to do our normal like post weekend triage as well and with that, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Dan to read the update for the libraries. OK, thanks, Scott. Uh, normally, uh, Tim, foamy guy, would read this section, but he's off watching the eclipse. So um, covers um, uh, things that all the CircuitPython libraries and related code and in the past uh, week, there were 10 pull requests merged by five authors, and there were seven reviewers. Um, a lot of these pull requests, none of them was more than two weeks old, more or less, that were merged. And so we have left, um, there are 71 open pull requests 
across all the libraries, of which there are hundreds. There are, in the past week, there are there were five issues closed by four people and nine issues opened by nine people. That leaves 737 open issues, of which five were marked as good first issue. So if you'd like to contribute to CircuitPython, um, working in the libraries is a good way to do that because it's all Python code. You don't have to do uh, low level C code on the CircuitPython core. Um, if you want to look look at circuitpython.org slash contributing, where you'll find a list of the open uh, pull requests and a list of open issues. You can look for, there's a few issues that are marked good first issue, which are relatively simple um, or straightforward, and you might look at those, but you could also just look over. There's a lot of issues that aren't marked that are probably pretty easy to deal with also. So take a look at those. Um, and I think that's, please feel, and feel free to ask us for mentoring help. We are happy to, we love having contributors to both libraries and course circuit Python. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Scott. All right. Um, I will cover uh, PyPI weekly download stats. I'm Ooh. sorry, I forgot to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. I have never read the library. Or, or not for the past three years. Or You're something. doing great, Dan. You're doing great. OK. Um, so PyPy is the um, Python, uh, the main regular Python's uh, place to download libraries from. And we do uh, upload all our libraries to there for download for various purposes. Um, there have been 136,852 PyPy downloads over 325 libraries. And uh, the most popular libraries tend to be requests and bus device, and then some other related libraries. Uh, in the past week, only um, two libraries were updated. Uh, the CircuitPython requests library, uh, and um, the CircuitPython Taml library, which I believe is a community library. Mm -hmm. And those have been those, so those are in the latest bundle. And that now I'm really finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. All right, and next we're going to ask uh, Melissa for a Blinka update. Yeah, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had two pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. Uh, there are currently four open pull requests amongst all the repositories. There was one closed issue by one person and one open by one person, leaving a net of 85 open issues. I believe most of those are like new board requests at this point. Um, there were 14,264 PyPI downloads in the last week, 11,356 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 133 boards. And that's it. Nice. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Uh, that's it for the state of CircuitPython libraries on Blinka. Uh, next up, we have hug reports. <clears throat> this is the first of, of two round robin sections where I will start and then it will go somewhat alphabetically through the folks uh, in the Discord channel and those who have dropped notes in the notes doc. Uh, if uh, folks have said that they are not present, um, there's actually, we're recording this during or close to an eclipse in part of the US. So there's a number of folks that are. Uh, doing things for that, um, but I'll read them off. They've dropped notes in here prior. Um, Hug Reports is a chance to say thanks to folks for what they've been working on and highlight all the cool things that people are doing within. Um, oh, and Fede2 says there's a, the, the eclipse is partial in Costa Rica as well. OK, so Hug Reports, let me start and then we'll go through the list. Uh, for me, I have a quick hug to all of the Pi Cascades organizers for a well-run conference full of py Pythonistas this past weekend. Next up is Dan. Okay, so thanks to Brushmate, who um, added code to uh, CircuitPython to be able to change the various names that um, USB MIDI presents when the USB MIDI device comes up. So there are two what are called interface names, and there are two um, jack names. MIDI jack names, and they, those were like fixed at a certain thing. 
and a lot of people have asked to change, be able to change them. And thanks to Brushmade for adding the code to do that. Thanks to Kevin J. Walters, who found a very odd issue where if you reuse an analog pin as a digital pin on NRF 5240, uh, it doesn't work right. And we thought maybe this, at first this was a, nine, a new nine bug, but it's present in eight and it could have been present since the beginning of time. So uh, it's not a common use case. So we'll look at it for sure though. And thanks to Scott for uh, 9X X, uh, issue triage meeting, which we had last Friday. That's it. Thanks, Dan. All right, next up I have notes from David. Uh, Glob says, <clears throat> hug to P3, LIM, Adrian L1, and Dan for hinting the use of microcontroller.nvm for hiding CircuitPy. Uh, hug to Dan for taking care of all of the CircuitPython releases and myself for working on the USB host feathering support. Next up is DJ Devin 3. Uh, thank you. I, I have a hug for Foamy Guy for going through my commits with a fine tooth comb, especially the typing PR where PyLint almost caused me to throw my keyboard across the room. Another hug for the Saturday morning stream on refactoring and improving circuit. A hug to El Pekinen for advice on catching line endings using ordinary values. I didn't end up using it, uh, but I learned a lot from the process. A hug to Toddbot for helping troubleshoot an SD card issue just a couple of minutes ago, which turned out to be bad soldering on my part. Uh, very nice catch, Toddbot. And a hug to Tanute for a nice Cascades preview on uh, Deep Dive this week, and I hope you get better soon. It does sound like you have a frog stuck in there. Yeah, and I like your frog emoji in the notes, too. Uh, thanks, Devin. Okay, uh, next up I have notes from Foamy Guy, who says, Hug reports to Scott, myself, for reviews and offering improvements to the Circup refactoring work. Hug to Al Pekinian and Dan H for helping me work through a bewildering issue with PyTest in Discord. Also, hugs to Al Pekinian for sharing ideas and improvements to an on-device testing utility that I've started to build, and a group hug. Next up from Jepler, we have a group hug as well. And now is Nick and Melissa. Let's see. Um, I have a hug for everybody who's been submitting their new boards at circuitpython.org to Rich Turf. Uh, Gab yeah, user Rich Turf, that is, uh, for opening an issue for a Blinka bug in PWMIO that I accidentally introduced and group hugged everyone else. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, last up, I have notes from uh, Mikhail Pakusa, who says, hug to Andres the cat for posting the issue about using Adafruit HTTP server with an AP, and hugs to Anicdata for testing the PR with AP and connection manager examples in HTTP server. That's it for hug reports. <clears throat> Next up, we have status updates, which is also done in a similar manner. Uh, but this time we want to hear what you've been working on the past week and what you plan on working on in the coming week. It's a great opportunity for folks to share knowledge if somebody's working on something that you've done before or if you want to collaborate together. Um, so it's cool to see all the different things that people are working on. I'll start and then we'll go down the list just like last time. So for me, uh, my Pi Cascades talk went as well as you could if I sound like this. Um, I'm really happy I did it on Friday before I started sounding like this on the deep dive stream. I'm wrapping up the USB host feathering support today and tomorrow. I did a good refactor during my stream on Friday and I want to just uh, bring it over to SAMD in particular and I have to update the, the documentation as well. I may spend a little time to finish adding Clang support to our make files, so not necessarily switching over to Clang fully, but at least getting a CI run that builds under Clang um, so that we can like ensure that we keep support. Uh, there's a CLI tool called Bear, which you can generate, use to generate a compile commands.json, which is used by the Clang D language server um, to determine like how each individual C file is actually compiled. Like, what include paths there are and things. Um, I got it set up on my laptop last night and it looks really helpful. So I'm gonna actually do that this afternoon for myself on my desktop. Um, I'm out most of next week for a Zephyr conference here in Seattle. And then on Friday, we're taking a family long weekend. So I won't be around much next week. 
And then just a heads up, I'll also be gone the first full week. I think it's the first full week of May, the 6th through 10th for a road trip with my dad. So I'll be out then too. All right, next up is Dan. Okay. Um, I released CircuitPython 903 as mentioned above. It's just uh, uh, one additional board and one uh, port fix. Um, as I mentioned, Scott and I also triaged the 9x bug list and we reduced the number of issues we want to work on from 33 to about 25. Some of those we pushed forward, some of those we closed, so forth. Um, somebody, some people noticed, or at least one person noticed that there were some read the docs builds that were really ancient. And it turns out, like we'd added some feature and they said, I didn't even know that feature was there because it wasn't in the documentation. That was because uh, around December, read the docs decided that they wanted for their, all their web hooks, they wanted what, what a secret, which is basically just a password that they generate you know, a key, a long key. And um, m many of the web hooks in the libraries did not have them. About 10% didn't have those secrets, either because they weren't copied over or because the web hook had been created so long ago that it was before Radiodocs was even using secrets. So I went through all of these by hand, which was an interesting amount of clicking. And uh, fixed the ones that needed secrets, uh, we ran some builds if it looked like they were really out of date, and also fixed some other problems with um, these, these web hooks. I didn't look at anything else kind of in this process, but I think that now nearly all the documentation will build reliably. There are a few um, documentation, RTP, RTP builds that are in the wrong style, and I think that's probably because there's something wrong with the, with the docs YAML file that's in those repos, but I neglected to write down which of those were, were there. So if you find one, bring it to our attention. And otherwise, I'm looking at uh, bugs to fix in uh, 910 and later versions of 9xx, looking at them, triaging them, figuring out if they're really bugs and fixing them if I can. That's it. Thanks, Dan. Okay, next up I'm going to read for David, who says, Improved my mouse jiggler by making it stealth but switchable by the boot button on the Cutie Pie 2040 using microcontroller.nvm0 to store a behavior flag. Um, soldering for the first time with prescription glasses, and this is a game changer. Great. Uh, the USB host feathering is ready to test uh, my work, and the DVI RP2040 feather is... Uh, to be ready to replicate the CPM emulator by Jeff. And next up, we have DJ Devon 3. Thank you. Uh, this week, I submitted a new API example for qtimes.com uh, API to add a fruit request. The API interacts with many different theme parks, uh, and the example only pulls from Disneyland. It shows the name of the ride, the queue time, if the ride is open or closed. And I handed that uh, idea off to the Ruiz brothers, who might uh, turn that into a project somehow, because uh, they're, you know, really interested in Disney stuff. Uh, I finally figured out a way to address the GitHub desktop issue, where it automatically converts all line endings to CRLF during checkout. I wrote a playground note on using Windows PowerShell to automatically convert them to LF line endings, and then it runs black, and then reuse, and then pre-commit all in one shot with two mouse clicks. This issue has plagued GitHub desktop users since its debut. Pretty sure every Windows GitHub desktop user uh, on the entire planet will want to know about this. Mm -hmm. This well, I'm not going to call it a fix, but it's definitely a nice workaround. Uh, I made some more progress on the ATEC crypto chip bug. Uh, I fooled it into thinking it's receiving a correct CRC match, and it started working as intended. Upon more investigation, I found that CRC1 and CRC2 uh, randomly do not match. Uh, early indications are pointing at some kind of analog voltage oscillator counter rollover uh, not working properly. Uh, the CRC mismatch error seems to occur when CRC1 reaches 65535, and I don't think that's a coincidence. And I finally got a working belt sander. I broke two of them this week, and I can sand and stain some new shelves. That's it. Nice. Thanks, Devin. All right. <clears throat> Next up, we have notes from Homie Guy uh, because he's out 
well, missing the live meeting to catch the eclipse, uh, refactoring Circup to break it up into smaller chunks to hopefully make it easier to understand, maintain, and develop new features for it. Resolving a few of the existing issues while I'm there and trying to work toward a new feature that would allow Circup to be used for loading library examples onto the connected device. In order to make my wish of Circup loading examples easier to achieve, I'd like to resolve a long-standing issue slash idea in Circup by the build tools to break up the examples directory into web directory per library rather than the existing way, which put all, all, puts all examples from all libraries into one folder together. Received all hardware and started wiring buttons for Simon Light Game, but I was too rough with the thin Grove cable wiring and my buttons are flaky if the wires are held perfect, absolutely perfectly. I'm planning to drop the Grove wing altogether and just wire the buttons to a Permaproto breadboard instead. All right, and that's from Homie Guy, and now we have notes from Jepler, uh, who says, out watching the eclipse today, hopefully, uh, worked a bit on the POSIX port. I found an interesting crash when trying to enter safe mode. I should make up a, a PR to fix it. The problem can occur if a safe mode reset message is printed before the QSTRIP rule is fully initialized. This happens to me in the POSIX port, but may or may not happen in quote in, oh, quote in real life. And last up, it, let's hear from maker Melissa. Hi, uh, let's see. I always have trouble finding that mute, unmute button. Uh, I worked through going uh, through the Raspberry Pi related guide feedback and uh, updating the guides as needed, and that's what I'm going to continue doing. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. And that's it for status updates. Uh, the last section we have here is in the weeds, which is a chance for any longer form discussion or questions that we have. Um, we've got one topic here today from DJ Devon 3 so I'll hand it over to them uh, to introduce the topic. Thank you. Uh, currently, all request API examples that I've contributed use an explicit uh, response.close to disconnect a socket. Anic data brought up a good point that using with request uh, dot data and then the source as request or yeah as response does not require an explicit close. Uh, any preference, does anyone have a preference on the syntax or method used? Anecdata says to me, quote unquote, to me, with is simpler than close, but it's another concept to grasp. So it might be beginner better for beginners to see the dot close, you know, the explicit dot close, uh, in order to see what the script is doing. Uh, I can submit a new API example that uses both methods so that somebody could see the with method right up against another identical um, that doesn't use the, the width and uses the response.close instead. Um, but this is, because it's in the Adafruit request library, that's not like that's not a decision that I, I can make that's up to like you guys. So width is better. And it's better because if you, um, if, it, and if an exception happens, width ensures that the close is still called. Um, it's not obvious that it works that way, but um, yeah, I so, did not know that. Okay. Yeah, it's a general Python thing that width is better because it happens even even when exceptions are raised, um, and I assume that works for Circuit Python too. But yeah, I I understand that it's um, it's a new mechanic, but um, I think width is really useful. Um, the term for it in CircuitPython is actually context managers, um, if you want to find more information on how that works. OK. Uh, are there any objections to me just going in and rewriting all of the stuff that has dot .closed to use with statements instead? Uh, do one first, please. OK. It can get a little tricky because you end up nesting stuff. Uh, oh, I have, I've have. i already done it on multiple things. examples. Okay, yeah, just push them in. So let's just double check that it looks okay. Okay. I would say one thing that's missing is that, uh, going up a level on all this is that you don't actually have like a guide about kind of like canonical and best practices for doing networking. Yeah. Options. There's a lot of like, there are these mirrored pages that show you, okay, here's how to do a simple something or other on this board and that board and the other board but there isn't like 
you know, we now have this display I.O. guide, but we don't have a, like an, a networking guide. And um, I know David Glowd said I, that he assumed there is a guide and there is not a guide <laughs> as far as I know. So uh, you might think about that in the long run. Like all these examples, for instance, that you're doing in the library are great, but a lot of people don't know to look at the examples directory in the library. And so uh, it doesn't, there aren't links to those things. And so maybe we'll bring this up internally about whether someone might write a guide. Or if someone writes to write a playground note or something like that, that would be great too. I, I could do that. I, I've done all of the API examples. I, I'm yeah. probably the best person to do it, yeah. I mean, I think, I'm thinking that you might want to write up your examples as playground notes. For all of them? Some of them? No, no, no. You could, well, you could do what you want. But no, <laughs> no, no, I don't want to do all yeah. of them. But to say, to make, it makes them more findable in Google searches and stuff like that. And we could cross-reference them. And uh, because otherwise, they're just like, oh, you can, here's this neat, thing that you could use to get this obscure data or this interesting data off this website. But the only place you're going to find a pointer to that is in a search result that's from GitHub. OK. And so how do we make that more visible? I but, think it's best uh, if you guys do something internally and have at least a guide that can be pointed to, and, and then I can point to that. That's yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. Yeah. When we guys work on CircUp to make examples more accessible, it might help too. Like in the art, you know, in the Arduino world, in the editor, you had that big drop down with like loading examples. Like in a Python, a CircuitPython Python equivalent like that would be really helpful. That's, <clears throat> that's interesting. I think maybe like we might even figure out some interesting way of listing them on this on circuitpython.org or something like that yeah and it's also um i've also thought about making a pyleap library for circuit python um where you could like use you know, like pyleap is good for projects and pulling projects down and doing mm -hmm. discovery like that maybe there's a world where we have a pyleap module that does that from circuit python itself um, that's interesting yeah it's also maybe a, maybe it's a feature to add to new, right? But that's a long that's they they would be very careful about that. Or code.circuitpython.org. Yeah. Is that is that a thing they can do? Because that would be cool. Is what new or for, for yeah? Because mu is like the the beginner level IDE that pretty much any beginner in Circuit Python goes straight for, unless they're on Linux, I guess. But for Windows, yeah, it's it's straight to Mu. Yeah, a lot of people use VS. I mean, people who and people who are programmers tend to. A lot of people use VS Code, which unfortunately. Right, but then those people are beginners. Is not great and all that. Yeah, I mean, I making it on a website might also be interesting because that's. Right. It's certain, Maybe someday it's certain, yeah. incorporate it with like web workflow. Maybe. The other thing that I was thinking about in this vein is whether, like, some people are exploring, like, in Python land, there's these notebooks, and it crossed my mind to whether we could um, run, like, notebook formatted Python code from the device itself, um, which would be neat, I think. Um, and if like editors have support to like automatically format like the text parts of that nicely, that would be cool too. Um, I'll have to look more into it, but uh, yeah. There is somebody that's made a plugin for Jupyter already for CircuitPython, but I'm thinking, um, I think it has to be tethered in that case, but I'm thinking more of like, a, it's, it's, it's code that's formatted and stored in CircuitPython in a way that when you load it, it runs well, or it, it like looks well in your editor, but still can run uh, standalone in the device too. So yeah, thinking about that. Okay, well that'll keep me busy. Awesome, thanks. You wanna add, add like if you just, maybe just if there's some, 
I'm not sure I have time right now, but if somebody wants to add like a few bullet items to the in the weeds so that it'll this this extra part will show up in the um, in the published notes. That would be interesting. Oh, like more oh, description of what we're what we can examples, like right, like yeah, that was there, the, the networking the, guy. You know, there might be a place to put examples. That was a topic that Fummy guy brought up in dev chat that probably should get added to the in in the weeds. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can somebody summarize that in the notes talk, please? I can do it. I might be able to just time. copy and paste what Fummy guy posted earlier. And... All right. I'll, I'll I'll do that in just a bit. So that is it for In the Weeds. Thanks, Devin. Um, I'm going to go back to my script to get us out and done for the day. <clears throat> so thanks, everybody. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for April 8th, 2024. Thanks to everybody who's participated. Even if you're looking at any clips and just added notes, we still appreciate to you adding notes and hearing what you're up to. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython for Adafruit, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will be also featured in the MyCon for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. The next meeting will be held next Monday, I believe. Yep. Uh, at the normal time, no no holiday next week. Uh, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, uh, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPython Nisa's role on Discord. With that, we hope to see you all next week. Uh, thanks, have a great week, we'll see you on Discord. Thank you for hosting, Scott. I hope you feel better. Thanks.